think we'll get started. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. Um, and uh, my only announcement is, as I said in the email, all our talks will now be going on YouTube, uh, assuming they're the kind of talks that people, that the speaker wants to make public. If you want to give a seminar and not make it public, that's also fine. Uh, but just so you know, these talks will be recorded and put online. Um, today, we have Eli Sherman of the uh, student in the computer science department at Johns Hopkins. Uh, presenting about causal inference with panel data. Uh, so go ahead, Eli. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, and then uh, Betsy and Michael, I don't think are on the call because they're at uh, a faculty meeting, but thanks to them for kind of scheduling this several months ago. And then and then also to uh, Liz Stewart, who kind of got the ball rolling on, on getting me to present uh, for, for the seminar. Um, I can't see all of you in the audience um, because my gallery view is disabled, but if you have a question, feel free to stop me uh, at any point and, and um, just, you know, I'll, I'll hear you and then, and then you can chime in uh, with your question. Okay, cool. So let's get going. Uh, this is joint work with uh, David Arbor, who is my mentor last summer at Adobe, uh, as well as Avi Feller and Alex Frank, who are respectively at uh, UC Berkeley and UCSD. So I'm gonna start with an example that should be pretty familiar to everybody on the call. Uh, COVID-19 uh, obviously is kind of the, the bane of our existence these days. Um, so, you know, as you all know, there, there have been uh, many thousands of deaths, hundreds of thousands of deaths worldwide uh, caused by COVID-19. And uh, we see that for each country, uh, they experience some plot of a death curve uh, as COVID-19 kind of makes its way into that country and starts starts infecting people and then eventually uh, people succumb to the to the virus. Uh, and so, naturally, if you're if you're a, a quantitative researcher, you might be interested in in figuring out how you can analyze this data um, to make policy decisions. So, for instance, Italy. Uh, during the course of their infection, saw that things were getting very much out of hand. And, and on March 11th, they closed most non-essential businesses in the country. Uh, and then seeing that deaths were not slowing down quickly enough and, and infections were not slowing down quickly enough, they implemented movement restrictions on uh, March 21st, nationwide movement restrictions. So uh, effectively, people could not leave the city that they were in, uh, weren't allowed to, to exercise outdoors. And, and for the most part, it was uh, a true lockdown, uh, similar to what, what we heard about in Wuhan and, and very dissimilar to what uh, people in the U.S. have experienced. And so you might wonder, what are the effects of these lockdowns? So if you're a public health expert, you want to know what is the efficacy of this lockdown? How, how much is it limiting the spread? Um, how, what are the economic impacts of, of the, the lockdown going to be in the long term? Uh, and then there are many other kind of tangential targets that people are going to be analyzing for a very, very long time. Uh, and, you know, you might, you might think about comparing, say, lockdowns in Italy, which are very severe, very strict, to uh, lock, the lockdown in the U.S., where it's more, you know, we're allowed to go to the grocery store, we're allowed to exercise outside, uh, and the result is there's, there's and, and, uh, and also there's less, uh, less enforcement, uh, less strict enforcement, and so there's more opportunities for people to not comply. And on the other hand, you have countries like Sweden that basically haven't imposed any restrictions and are seeing their own version of this death curve. And so in the long run, people are going to be interested in, um, you know, what are the what are the economic impacts? What are the, the long-term health impacts on non-COVID related illnesses? And in the short term, people want to say, what are, what are the impacts with respect to uh, say, controlling the disease and, and, and mitigating the impacts of the disease. So in order to answer these questions, there are a number of, of types of data that people might collect. Um, cases, death by day, uh, various information about, about those kind of tertiary outcomes. Uh, but ultimately, you need a, a very clear method methodological approach to answer these questions. So uh, ultimately, what I'm describing is this type of data collection where, where data is collected for 
several countries or several states uh, over time regularly as known as panel data. So there are a number of, of methods to, to try and estimate these sorts of targets. Um, kind of the two existing primary methods are uh, outcome modeling, where you're, you're tracking uh, the outcome of interest over time for these several units and, and fitting a time series model. Um, usually you're just fitting the time series mo model to the unit that you care about. Uh, or alternatively, uh, weighting methods where you observe these over time for several units and then you, you uh, model selection into treatment. So for instance, selection of, of Italy choosing to adopt uh, a lockdown uh, and then try and estimate the impact of that, uh, that intervention by using similar interventions or similar uh, non-interventions, sorry, non-interventions in similar countries uh, and trying to use that to kind of infer this counterfactual under no treatment. So you can compare the impact or you can get a, an estimate of the impact by comparing the true observed outcome under intervention to the counterfactual intervention, uh, counterfactual under no intervention. And so what I'm gonna talk, to, talk about today is, is sort of a hybrid approach where we use multitask Gaussian processes to try and answer this question. Uh, so formalizing the data, uh, making it a little bit more clear. So on the left is, is what we observe. So uh, we observe a matrix of outcomes for, for the various units or tasks. So in the case of COVID, uh, you might think about countries or it, within the US state by state. Uh, and then we observe this over time. And so what we're gonna be interested in is a single treatment time, T0. Uh, and after that treatment time, uh, there's going to be, we're going to assume a single treated unit uh, for simplicity. You could extend these methods to, to multiple treated units, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, but we're, for now, we're going to assume a single treated unit, just unit one. And so after treatment time, so my, my treatment indicator is W, after treatment time uh, for unit one, treatment is going to be positive or it's going to be, it's going to be binary equal one. So the unit we care about is treated, and then for all the other treatment, uh, for the other units uh, are going to be control units where they're untreated. And then counterfactually, what we care about is estimating what happens when this, if this first unit were to be not treated. So, uh, in order to in order to evaluate the impact of an intervention, we're going to be comparing what we observed over here to some counterfactual for this what was treated unit counterfactually under no treatment. Uh, and the high level idea, is, as I hinted, uh, is that we're gonna try and use data uh, from potentially pre-treatment observations for the treated unit or pre-treatment and pot potentially post-treatment observations uh, for the control unit. So what do we want from a model that, that does this? So, we want reasonable uncertainty quantification. We want to be able to say uh, with what certainty, uh, how sure are we of our estimate of, of this counterfactual under no treatment? Uh, and we want this uncertainty to, to behave reasonably um, over time. So you, you'd expect to see that the further out you're projecting, the more, uh, the more uncertain you are about your estimate. Uh, and then we also want to be able to, to estimate uh, uncertainty for, remember, we're only thinking about a single treated unit. We want to be able to estimate the uncertainty for that single treated unit or extend that to, to multiple treated units. Uh, and then in addition to that, we want flexibility in how we model the data. So we want to think about things moving smoothly over time rather than there being uh, jumps in the time series. Uh, we want to be able to handle nonlinearities uh, with, with non-parametric methods. Uh, and we want to be able to have some control over the, this hybrid approach between using outcome-based methods and weighting-based methods. So our proposal is to use multitask Gaussian processes. Uh, multitask, uh, multitask Gaussian processes are a Bayesian multivariate time series model. So uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to assume that we observe uh, data along some sequence a uh, sequence of data along some index dimension. So in this case, we'll, we'll be using time. People have used these for uh, geostatistics and, and thinking about uh, the relationship between things that are, are related in space. 
Um, and so the, the method at a high level uh, entails specifying a, a prior over the mean and the covariance between points over time, uh, and then estimating a posterior predictive distribution of the outcome of interest and then sampling from that posterior predictive distribution. So um, you can kind of see it from this example, this is just a, a single task example, um, but if you haven't seen multitask Gaussian processes before, this will hopefully illustrate. So the idea is um, this dotted line that's um, very kind of very faint in the picture is the true data generating process. Uh, it's, this is just a toy example. It's a, it's a sinusoidal curve. Uh, and then say you observe some time point or some observations over time. Uh, as the analyst, you're going to then specify some prior belief about the parameter that you think governs the, the true data generating process. Uh, and then given the prior that you've specified, which again is not supposed to, to take knowledge of the data, it's supposed to take beliefs about the data, but not actual knowledge about the observations into account. You're going to merge that with the data and then calculate a posterior. Uh, and then from that posterior, you're going to sample uh, to get estimates of what this distribution looks like. So formally, uh, we have a distribution over functions. Uh, there's going to be two parameters that we care about. One is going to be, uh, or sorry, three, three parameters that we care about. One is going to be the mean function, so uh, governing kind of where where vertically on this axis points are going to points are going to be landing, and then uh, the second one is a time covariance function or kernel, uh, which governs the covariance between points over time, and then the third one because we're using a multitask approach uh, is is a cross task covariance. So it's the relationship between say if say you observe two time points uh, for different series but at the same time. Or you you make two observations of, of two different theories at the same time. Uh, what's the relation between those? And then um, kind of expanding that out for for the full time series. Um, and so the 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 model that governs our observations is defined by a normal distribution over these functions. So rather than uh, a fixed mu or a fixed covariance, and draw and saying that y is Gaussian distributed. Uh, it's distributed according to these functions. Um, here I'm using Kronecker products to, to compose my kernel and my and my task covariance. Uh, Kronecker product uh, is described is just a linear algebra term. It's described here. Uh, and then finally, the um, this D term is going to be a, a diagonal matrix of our our uh, noise variances. So each observation has some noise attached to it, and so we're going to be specifying a prior over this D, and that's going to act as our regularization. So there's a lot here, but the, the main takeaway I want you to understand is that Y is, is governed by these distributions over functions, uh, and we're going to be making choices for M, K, theta, and D uh, through our prior, our choice of prior that uh, allow us to, to have a flexible control over the model, and then different choices are going to lead to different uh, different performance in, in how well the model fits. Ultimately, in the in the sense that I'm going to show, um, you have enough control that you can you can perform really well. But in in some cases, there's going to be a trade off. Uh, if you go out into the wild and use it, there's going to be a trade off between using something that's kind of reasonable and, and interpretable and getting Good model fit that you can that you can trust. Um, so inference, this is the the gist is we're maximizing to the details here, um, but the gist is uh, we do this in a way that that we ignore. Um, we're going to ignore say. Say we're we're not going to be maximizing for all the series jointly because we don't want to learn something that's going to fit really well for the control series and then end up not fitting as well for pre-treatment uh, for the, the the series that we care about the, the treated series uh, which would constitute negative transfer and finally um, through some math you can derive this posterior predictive. Uh, 
um, distribution. And so our counterfactuals for Y hat, so this is, this is the Y that we care about. You'll fill in one here for that, that treated unit, indexing that treated unit. Uh, and then the time point that you care about is given by this equation. So some additional assumptions uh, that we're making here, we're gonna assume that noise terms are additive and independent and that there's linear cross-task dependence. Um, relaxations of these are pretty easy in the, in the multitask literature. Um, these sorts of things haven't really been studied uh, in, the, in the panel data setting. So this is one easy avenue to, to extend uh, off of the existing panel data panel data literature that existing methods, there isn't a straightforward way to make these extensions. Um, and then the bigger assumption that we're making is the stationary of the time, stationarity of the time series. So uh, the mean and covariance functions aren't changing over time. It, I don't have the notation here, but you could think of it as like uh, the K, the, the, the kernel function here uh, is the same kernel function forever, uh, rather than having a different big, big K over time. Um, relaxing this is a little bit harder um, and, and not being able to, to allow that to vary is pretty important because it means that we have more trouble modeling the seasonal or periodic effects. I, in the example I gave uh, above, like the, the um, in the sinusoidal curve, we're able to capture this pretty well, but uh, you know, if, if there was a linear trend upward, uh, it, it's actually harder to capture that with what we're assuming. So you might ask why use a Bayesian model? Um, for those who are not so familiar with Bayesian statistics, I'll, I'll briefly go over it. Um, basically, the idea is that we can assume some param parameterization on, uh, that governs our counterfactuals and the observed data and the parameters. Uh, and Based on the parameterization that we assume, we can uh, decompose the parameters into two different parts. So one is gonna be the, the parameter that governs the marginal potential outcome. So that's P of Y under treatment and P of Y under no treatment, uh, and those separated and, and independent. And then one is the parameter that, govern, that governs the association of those two. Uh, and so under some assumptions, which are Standard in the Bayesian causal inference, you know, framework. I'll I'll get into kind of the details of why this might be a, a nonsensical thing to do, or, or what to do if you don't believe the assumptions uh, towards the end. Uh, but basically, under these assumptions, uh, we can restrict attention to just the marginal, the the parameter governing the marginal potential outcome, uh, and then you get a posterior that's this big hairy. Uh, expression on the right hand side. Uh, and so from there, then your task is pretty simple. So you specify a prior, so you specify a belief over what your parameter for the marginal uh, potential outcomes are. From there, given the data that you observed, you estimate the posterior distribution of that parameter um, given, the, given the data you observe. And then you can simulate uh, the, the distribution of the counterfactuals that you care about. Uh, and so when you're, you're you, from there you obtain a posterior predictive distribution of uh, the counterfactuals of interest. And so to get estimates of the counterfactual, you simply sample from this distribution. So important things to, to note that we're, that we're able to benefit from, from assuming this Bayesian framework. So, our estimates are given by repeated draws from this distribution. What does that mean? That means because the, the distribution is a finite sample approximation, it means that the uncertainty that we're getting in our estimates uh, is, is naturally the uncertainty that we care about. Um, and importantly, so say you sample, you have the mean of those samples, that's gonna be your, your point estimate of what the counterfactual of interest is. And then the variance of those samples naturally is the variance uh, that, that you're gonna report uh, on these counterfactuals. Uh, and another important thing is because we're conditioning uh, on, say, on pretreatment data, um, we're not gonna be, our, our estimates are not gonna be a function of post-treatment data, and so um, post-treatment data for the treated series. And so the point is, 
you only care about that treated series, observations of that treated series up until the treatment time. And so there's no spillover of using post-treatment observations to inform your, your estimates of uh, the counterfactual under no treatment. So the basic advantages of this model, um, the model that I described you know, over the last three slides, is that we can flexibly trade off between outcome and weighting based estimators. So uh, I'll go back briefly. Everything relies on, um, on this K and theta that we're choosing and the M that we're choosing. And so uh, as I'll discuss in, in the simulations and, and uh, towards the end of the talk, uh, there's a lot of control over what goes on in the interplay between sort of the time model or the outcome model and the, the task or weighting model. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if you choose to have more of a task-based model or you can uh, just, just focusing on the task that you care about, you can specify your priors in a way such that K is the only thing that has an impact on this prediction and that theta goes away. Or alternatively, if you want to use a weighting based estimator, you can make K go away and then rely primarily on data. Um, in addition, there's a natural, you know, this provides a natural framework for imposing smoothness on our time series. So that, that comes through the choice of, of the kernel K that you're going to use. Uh, so existing methods don't really do a good job of this. Existing methods uh, are, are making stronger assumptions about the, the nature of their time series and, and uh, don't allow for uh, smoothing over time. And, and as an example, what you could do in, uh, in the multitask Gaussian process framework is you could assume a specific kernel function. So say an RBF kernel or a matern kernel, um, which smooth uh, the time series. In addition, as I discussed in, in the previous slide, uh, because we're using this Bayesian framework, we, we basically get uncertainty quantification for free. So uh, when you take draws from your posterior predictive distribution, uh, the variance of that distribution is going to be a quantification of your uncertainty. Again, existing methods have uh, approaches to, to do this uncertainty quantification, but in general, they're not well justified or they, they rely on, on pretty strong assumptions. And granted, there are strong assumptions in, in what's going on here, um, but you can reason about them a little bit more clearly, as I'll argue. Uh, and then in addition to that, uh, by combining the outcome model and a, and a task-based model, you should have uncertainty that grows with time the further out your projection grows. This is all baked into kind of this basic model that, that I discussed before. Also, along with multitask Gaussian processes, is a long literature in the machine learning community uh, that allows some pretty straightforward extensions that it would be you know, very convenient for the panel data setting. So extending to non-Gaussian likelihoods. So say, um, going back to the, to the COVID example, say that you care not about COVID cases where you can kind of treat the data as being continuous, even though obviously deaths and cases are, are, are discrete simply because of the scale of the, uh, the numbers that you're looking at. But say you want to estimate the impact of lockdown orders on crime, where in an area crime was already very limited and you, you want to analyze, say, a very, a, what is in an absolute term, very small decrease. Uh, using data or using methods that assume that the data is continuous isn't really straightforward here, but using uh, this multitask Gaussian process approach, you could actually change this to say multitask Poisson processes and get uh, get an approach to doing discrete data, pa discrete panel data for free. Uh, in addition, you could think about changing uh, the assumptions about the air terms. Right now, we're assuming that air is is Gaussian and mean zero. You could you could instead think about using T airs, which are heavier tailed and so would get you a more conservative estimate of your air. Uh, and then sensitivity analysis, uh, which I'll get into a little bit later. Okay, I'm gonna pause uh, before I get into experiments and, and offer time for questions if anybody has anything. Uh, I have a question, sort of a general question about causal imprints with panel data. 
Um, so when, when you have panel data, like data that's um, indexed in space or time, um, how do you interpret the parameters that you're estimating in terms of what their out of sample generalizability is, or do you just view them as ingredients to get reasonable estimates of counterfactual outcomes? So I, I would say the latter. So for the most part, um, panel data methods are used as, I want to evaluate the impact of, of this specific intervention. So the, the example that I'll, I'll cover starting in the next slide is, um, about a very specific policy and and the idea that that at least the use use cases so far have been i i know that this policy was something that somebody did and i want to estimate the impact and you know any sort of generalizability is is going to be from kind of the the qualitative assessment of what's going on rather than being able to ascribe any sort of formal you know formal weight to the generalizability of the method. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, thanks. Cool. All right. Um, then I guess I will move on. Okay, so thanks to Brian for leading me into my next slide. So um, kind of, there are, there are a lot of uh, canonical examples that, that people policy examples that people have studied in in the panel data setting the one that i'm going to talk about here is is uh, a tax cut adopted in kansas in, in 2012 so in 2010 uh governor sam brownback was elected in kansas as kind of a tea party uh candidate in response to what have you that was going on in the in the U.S. preceding 2010, uh, and in early 2012, uh, he encouraged the Kansas State Legislature to adopt a, a massive personal income tax cut. Uh, the tax cut was projected at the time to to uh, result in 930 billion dollars of reduced taxes tax burden on the the people living in Kansas, and it was projected to increase jobs. The number of jobs in the state by 23,000 uh, by 2020, and as you can see from this plot, the the real Kansas is is in black, um, or the solid line. Following the tax cut, the the gross state product went down a little bit, and then started to go back up, and then started to to downturn again in in 2015, and in response to the the uh, gross state product decreasing, uh, the there were calls for the legislature to repeal this tax law. They they viewed it as uh, a, a defeat for supply side economics, uh, and so the the legislature decided to vote to repeal the tax and then uh, had to override a, a governor's veto. And so, say you're an economist, you want to understand the the efficacy of supply side uh, economics and, and the efficacy of, of tax cut based uh, measures to increase economic growth, you might be interested in, in, in estimating counterfactually what would have happened to Kansas's gross state product had they not implemented this tax cut and then compare that counterfactual to the actual observed outcome. Uh, and so the synthetic control method, which is a very popular panel data method, uh, which I'll, I'll give more details on in a little bit. Um, basically, the idea would be that you project this out and then compare the differences. Uh, uh, what we do here is we fit the our multitask Gaussian process model to this data and then try and project out uh, this counterfactual and compare our approach to the uh, existing methods. And so, in order to be able to, to get a, a real quantification of, of how the MTGP performs, uh, rather than straight up using the data, or rather rather than using this data immediately, uh, we instead fit uh, a model to the data, and then we can use that model as, as an oracle, as ground truth on uh, what, the, what the counterfactual should be. So the state of the art, prior to NTGPs, I guess the, the jury is still out on whether or not NTGPs can justifiably 
that be said to be the best, but uh, kind of the state of the art is, is viewing panel data as a latent factor model. Uh, and so we fit a latent factor model that looks like this. I'm not gonna go super into the details. Um, basically, uh, there's a, a unit fixed effect, a time fixed effect that's shared across uh, across the units, and then these latent factors that uh, capture uh, the relationship between unit and time, and then an air term. Uh, so we basically, we fit this model to the data, and then we draw samples uh, of these parameters from the data, uh, and then generate new data to, to uh, fit the MTGP and all the comparison models too. Uh, and then from there, we, can, we evaluate the performance based on what the ground truth of these parameters are, where ground truth is in heavy quotation because it's learned via this linear factor model. Uh, and then we get results of bias in, in RMSE. One thing I want to highlight is that um, an important factor in modeling, in, in evaluating uh, synthetic data for and, and synthetic experiments for panel data is that often other papers that have proposed methods don't really take into account the, the fact that you're, you need to select uh, the unit into treatment. So for instance, uh, if Kansas is your only treated unit and then you just only worry about Kansas in, in, uh, in your experiments and only estimate the impact for Kansas, then uh, you might get unreliable results. Uh, and so what we do here is we actually model selection uh, by calculating the propensity of treatment given these parameters that we fit. Uh, and then we select one unit to be treated with uh, a normalized probability. Uh, and then we treat that as the ground truth. Uh, some practical considerations on the, uh, on the MTGP that we're fitting here. So we use a matern kernel. Matern kernels are, um, a, a twice twice differentiable kernel, so basically it, it allows you to smooth over time uh, in comparison to what is a more a more well known kernel, the RBF kernel. Um, a turn is a little bit bumpier, and so it's more realistic uh, in some sense. Uh, and then we assume a linear task covariance, and we ignore uh, our outcome model, our intercept outcome model for the time being. And so what we see here is that. Uh, GSense, which is the, the linear factor model, obviously performs the best because it's, it's the Oracle model in, in both of these experiments. The difference between these two being uh, whether it's a high variance or a low variance uh, uh, data generating process. And then aside from GSense, which again is the Oracle, MTGP outperforms all the other models. Uh, and so, you know, I, I caution against saying that MTGP is the best. Obviously, it does work. Here, it has higher bias and higher RMSE, um, but that's because, you know, arguably because we're using GSynth as, as the, the ground truth. And so, you know, you'd have to figure out a, an alternative way to, to evaluate how MTGP compares uh, to GSynth. But for now, we'll say that they're more or less comparable uh, and that MTGP actually provides several benefits uh, aside from performance that, that lend credence to the idea that you should be using MTGPs instead of these other methods. Uh, and then applying MTGPs to the actual data, not the simulated, the simulated uh, and then drawn data, um, we see that there's kind of this trade-off between using uh, a model, an MTGP that favors uh, a single task or time series only model and favors a uh, a pure transfer or, or synthetic control style model. Um, and so what we see is if you basically this corresponds to in the MTGP setting theta to uh, setting theta to be an identity matrix. So you're basically just ignoring it and then you're only fitting using you're only fitting that kernel K. Uh, and so what we see it gets very nice pre-treatment fit, and then the uncertainty, as you would like to see, uh, grows over time. But the behavior here is that this is very mean reverting. And so um, the further you get out away from the treatment time, you're going to go back to, to what was the, the long-term mean. Um, 
And then on the other hand, in, in the pure transfer setting, the, the pretreatment fit isn't as good. Um, and then after, after uh, treatment time, your projections are that uh, you get a very nice like parallel trend here, uh, but the uncertainty immediately blows up right at treatment time, and then it's basically constant uncertainty over time, which isn't necessarily a reasonable thing. And so if you combine the two, you can get the, the nice pretreatment fit with the time series, uh, and then you get uncertainty that moves with um, moves as a kind of as a function over time, and so this is a nice merging of the two. Uh, and so really the, the insight here is that you don't necessarily have to completely eliminate the weighting based model or completely eliminate uh, the outcome model. You can actually, uh, based on your, your prior selection over the kernel and over the task covariance, you can actually tune between, uh, tune a balance between uh, the outcome and the weighting based model. Okay, pause again for questions if they've come up. Okay, cool. Um, so throughout, I've been kind of alluding to the existence of these other models. I, I haven't given clear details and kind of relied on either you know them or you don't. Um, but what I want to highlight in this section is that MTGPs actually can be reduced to uh, obtain the same predictions that, that you would get from all these pre-existing models. So I'm gonna go through some of the kind of the workhorses, the best known models that, that exist uh, for this setting. And then I'll highlight and, and hopefully convey that you can obtain uh, the performance or the predictions of each of these models uh, by making certain assumptions on the, the more general NTGP model. Uh, and then obviously the, the benefits of uncertainty quantification and, and the extensions that we that I discussed earlier, those will all carry over. And so if you're married to the idea of using these existing models, you can still gain a benefit by using the, the using the NTGP approach. Uh, so difference and differences, uh, the, the basic idea is you, uh, for your different units, you observe the outcome over time and you make this very strong, very unrealistic assumption that uh, that the trends in that you observe over time are going to be parallel, and so that the, so the point is like there's some um, some temporal effect that's shared across the units, uh, but and then the the only thing that di that governs the difference between the units is uh, uh, like a cross unit parameter, and then after you've observed the intervention, uh, you maybe this this top unit has an increase post intervention, but based on this parallel trends assumption, you can project out uh, what the outcome would have been had that unit not been treated, and then consider the difference as your effect estimate. Uh, so in math, there's again a, a, a unit based uh, effect and then a time based effect, and these are shared. This is shared across all units, and uh, this is shared across all time points. Uh, and so what I, what I hope to convey, it's, it's not necessarily going to be immediately clear in, in, a, in a talk, in an hour-long talk, but if you were to, to stare at the model for a while, you'd be able to see this insight. But starting with our, um, our predictive uh, equation for, for the counterfactual Y, if you set the, the M model, the, the time series model, to be just the mean of the, the prior outcome, the previously observed outcomes, pre-treatment outcomes for that unit, uh, and then set K to be linear, and basically you ignore this, this cross-task term by setting it to be identity and ignore the regularization by setting D to be zero, uh, then you see that this term on the bottom corresponds very nicely to this term on the top, where this is our unit fixed effect, this is our temporal effect, and then this is uh, this is a centered version of the outcome, which corresponds to the the zero mean errors. Um, moving on to the synthetic control method, uh, this is another workhorse in the in the panel data setting. Uh, the The basic idea here is you observe um, some outcome over time. The the canonical example here is is 
uh, this smoking tax that was passed in California in, in the late 80s. Uh, and so you observe that California had some degree of, of smoking sales or cigarette sales per capita. And then that was starting to go down over time. Uh, and then similarly, the, the rest of the US was going down over time and California passed a law and you'd like to project out uh, what would have happened to California's tobacco sales had they not uh, had they not adopted this law and and the idea of the method is that you take a weighted average of the other states in the United States uh, match that to California pretreatment and then project that out and so the idea is you're you're uh, you're finding weights on the other states and you want to minimize the difference between the weights on the other states and uh, and the actual observed outcome pre-treatment, so up to the treatment time. Uh, and then the way that you perform inference is you simply multiply the weights that you learned over here by the, uh, the other outcomes at the time that you care about. And so linking this back up with, with NTGPs, uh, if you, again, starting with the, the fully general model, or as general as, as we've covered, as I've covered, uh, if you ignore kind of the unit fixed effect uh, and set K to be the identity, so, so you're ignoring temporal uh, effects, and then keep theta as is and get rid of regularization, then this resulting term looks very similar to this synthetic control. Um, one, one key insight about synthetic controls is that uh, you, the, the, the method assumes that the control units uh, form a convex hull around the, the, the uh, treated unit. And the idea, in, and that's in the, the pre-treatment. So the idea is California needs to lie somewhere within, uh, somewhere between the rest of the states, if you were to plot the rest of the states on this graph. Uh, and without that, the method fails. Uh, so we can impose that constraint in, in the NTGPs uh, by imposing, by, by assuming a prior on theta uh, that forces the, the resulting posterior predictive distribution to lie in a multinomial. Uh, for those who are curious, it's assuming that it's, a, it's drawn from a Dirichlet distribution. Uh, this is, this is, these prior uh, posterior relationships are things that are well, kind of well known in the Bayesian literature. Um, but basically the idea is like you can you can enforce the constraints that these existing methods have assumed on the MCGP in order to, to recover the same uh, prediction. That brings me to, to hybrid approaches. So I mentioned latent factor models before. Um, the gist is you're combining, uh, you're, you're now from kind of that, that difference in differences uh, model from two slides ago. You're now allowing for um, effects for for different effects for each unit, um, and those are they, there's a different time unit effect uh, by virtue of this uh, this dot product. Um, we can recover this again by making assumptions on the the fully general model, so getting rid of the outcome model for the time being, and then imposing k and data to both be linear. And again, this should look very similar to what we see up here. Uh, and finally, the, the um, kind of a very recent uh, approach to, to doing panel data is the augmented synthetic controls method, which takes the, the conventional synthetic controls estimator uh, and adds a bias adjustment term, uh, which in theory could help when, when you have poor pretreatment fit. Uh, and so, Drawing this connection again, so we we uh, take the same approach for uh, for uh, isolating isolating the cross task covariance, and so you would fit you'd specify the same prior here uh, as you would for synthetic controls, uh, but then you add in uh, uh, an outcome modeling term, uh, which serves as your bias correction. Um, so a couple of insights that that we gained in, in the course of developing, uh, developing this method, or, or rather applying this method from the machine learning community to a very different setting. Uh, 
is that you can reinterpret a lot of these existing methods uh, in, in slightly different ways and, and kind of learn things about them uh, by viewing them through the lens of multitask Gaussian processes. So for instance, in, in two-way fixed effects or difference in differences, uh, the insight is that there are many ways to, to represent an outcome model. So uh, you know, in, in the above methods, for instance, I, when I wanted an outcome model, I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow myself to have an outcome model when I wanted for, for simplicity to ignore the outcome model, I, I just said, set the outcome model to zero. Um, ultimately, you can bake that outcome model into the, to the time covariance term, term. You know, you can bake that into uh, the kernel K that you're, that you're learning. Um, and so there's actually a lot of flexibility in, what, in what's going on here and, and whether you want uh, a relationship between time and task as, as in kind of the K times theta uh, version or whether you want a unit of fixed effects in, in, uh, by having kind of an isolated outcome model. Uh, in the case of synthetic controls, uh, this kind of simplex constraint, the, the idea that you're assuming weights are in the convex hull, um, that is an assumption on the optimization problem that's, that's being carried out to fit the weights. Uh, the, the view here is that if, you, uh, if, if you're instead placing a prior on a parameter through kind of this, this Bayesian viewpoint, uh, the result is that you're making uh, an assumption on the model. Uh, and so these correspond very nicely to each other. And, and as I'll argue in a minute, like there's arguably bene it's beneficial to view it as, as a, an assumption on the model because then you have more control over what's going on and it's a little bit more explicit uh, what, what the assumption entails. Um, similarly, synthetic controls forbids these negative weights because it, it assumes that everything has to be non-negative and fun to one. Um, if you allow for ne negative weights, this might correspond to negative task correlation between the, the you know, say the treated unit and, and various untreated units. Um, in ArcSynth, kind of going back to uh, this trade-off between outcome and, and task models, uh, you can now view it in, in these two different lenses and, and realize that there's actually a lot of flexibility. And if you're if you are going to use augmented synthetic controls, there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do, uh, you could think about fitting an outcome model and then augmenting with a cross task residual. So that's augmenting with the synthetic control, uh, synthetic control weight, um, or the, the predictions from synthetic controls. Or alternatively, you could flip that and fit synthetic controls as the, the original augsense model does, um, and then augment with the outcome-based residuals. And the, the result is that you're often going to get a very similar fit, but it might be beneficial in some cases or, or you know, one, one case or another to use one or another of these based on what assumptions you want to make uh, about the time series or about the, the relationships of tasks. Uh, so that brings me to kind of the big, big picture takeaways. So obtaining pretreatment fit is surprisingly, it, you know, it, you, you don't get perfect fit, but you get very nice fit. Um, for both for both of the canonical examples at, at the very least, so both the the Kansas tax cut example uh, and the California example, uh, but you should question this a little bit because there's only 50 units that you're fitting from, uh, and if you're getting pretreatment fit that's very nice from a lot of very different methods, uh, that suggests that there's uh, there's more going on than just than just being able to fit with either a linear, you know, a linear temporal model or some sort of weighting-based estimator. Um, and so ultimately, if you're choosing between outcome or weighting-based estimator, you're making this choice uh, without support from the data. It's not like you can fit and then regularize and, and then fit better. Um, it's, you're, you're trying to make a decision that's kind of unjustifiable from the data. And that leads us to the insight that there's under identification going on here. Uh, ultimately, the, you know, the problem that you're trying to, trying to solve, uh, there's many ways to do it. And, and you're opening yourself up to uh, kind of making an unjustifiable decision. Uh, and ultimately, like the, the argument that, that, that we like to move towards uh, with this work is that 
you should be very careful about what uncertainty estimates you're drawing from from your uh, from you know, your inferences and uh, and you should be very careful that the assumptions you're making about the, the model and about the data are clear and, and, and correspond to, to something that's real, realistic rather than, for instance, uh, synthetic controls just saying, well, the weights have to be non-negative and summed to one, which is rather arbitrary. Um, takeaway four, uh, kind of following along with what I just said, existing work encodes these constraints uh, into the optimization problem, which is Oh, you know, arbitrary, but also somewhat uh, opaque. Uh, whereas, if you uh, are ex uh, explicitly encoding the constraints based on the the prior that you're making, or based on the the causal assumptions that you're making, um, then at the very least, like it's clear what the assumption is, rather than just hoping that the optimization problem solves it. Um, and it also forces you to think very hard, as you know, as is true of of the assumptions that are made in causal inference, it forces you to think hard about the assumption rather than just kind of throwing it out there and saying, okay, like we got good, we got good fit. Uh, that's what matters. Um, and then finally, kind of the going back to the, the Bayesian approach. So the benefit of using this, this viewing things from the Bayesian lens uh, is that it provides us a, an opportunity to relax these unrealistic assumptions in a reasonable way. Um, all approaches involve assumptions. So, for instance, in NTGPs, I kind of, I kind of swept it under the rug. I left it as a, as a footnote, uh, 20 some odd slides ago, um, saying that there's uh, this ignorability assumption. So, so there's independence between the counterfactual outcomes, why, why under treatment, why under no treatment, given the data and given the parameter. Um, there are a lot of reasons to think that that's not realistic or, or not reasonable. Um, and there are a lot of high profile instances recently of, of people trying to basically just like fit stuff that they say is identified when clearly the, there's, you know, there's issues with identification here. Uh, and so what you could think about doing is relaxing those ignorability assumptions and then under those ignorability assumptions, I said we could ignore this theta A now, if you relax the, those assumptions, you could view theta A as, as a sensitivity parameter and then try and do sensitivity analysis um, using, you know, by, by now accounting for that. Um, and your uncertainty will grow, but that's good because we want to be conservative rather than uh, too liberal with, with the estimates that our, our model is outputting. Um, one thing, since this is a biostats audience, I wanted to, to mention is that uh, you could think about maybe using marginal structure models in this setting. So, um, you know, it's a time series model. You have lots of samples, especially if, if you have more than one treated unit, you could think about doing that. Uh, it's not entirely clear what the connection is uh, between MSMs and any of the panel data methods. Uh, and so one thing to think about uh, that you know, I, I'd be happy to hear from people that know more about MSM than me uh, would be what are thoughts on reconciling the MTGP framework or MTGP approach to panel data with uh, marginal structure models. Uh, and then beyond that, there's a lot of open problems. Some of them are pretty straightforward by virtue of, of uh, what MTGPs allow. Uh, and some of them are uh, a little bit more complex. So uh, basically, all panel data papers assume a single treated unit. Um, for some of the papers, it's pretty straightforward how to extend, uh, or it's implied that it's straightforward, but maybe isn't actually true that it's straightforward to extend to multiple treated units or multiple treatment times. So going back to the COVID example, if every country or all but a few countries adopt, uh, adopt a lockdown uh, measure, uh, then it's it becomes hard to, to, to reason about what the counterfactual had any of those countries not adopted uh, a, lockdown, uh, a lockdown measure. And similarly, all those countries are adopting their measures at different times. And so, uh, you know, how do you account for, how do you account for different treatment times uh, if there's this cross task variance? Um, it's gonna require a few further assumptions. Uh, this is kind of open work, especially in the case of COVID, 
it involves kind of a structural break. So it's, it's something that, you know, wasn't even in the realm of, of our collective thinking until three months ago. Uh, and then in addition to that, you can think about regular time sampling. This is something that's baked in to the MTGP literature and, and actually should follow very nicely and other methods don't account for uh, very well. And then uh, you can think about adding more, more modeling flexibility. So I, I mentioned non-Gaussian likelihood um, and then also thinking about talking, uh, thinking about assessing, uh, uh, assessing and developing sensitivity analysis for this problem. Uh, with that, I'm going to open it up to questions and, and thank you all for listening. It would have been nice to see faces while I was doing that. It's it a little bit weird to just kind of talk at a screen. <laughs> Does anyone have questions for Eli? Um, well, I have one I can start. Um, this is just going back to a footnote, actually, on one of your slides. But do, do you have an example of uh, other Bayesian method or Bayesian methods for hidden confounding latent models? Well, so so there have been not 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 for panel data. I want to be clear, not for not for this setting specifically, but uh, recently. So, so kind of in, uh, you know, Betsy's not here, but Betsy in her in her uh, talk about dependence harps on the existence of Bayesian methods for kind of genomics. So there's there's cases there where under some assumptions you can you can uh, get effect estimates even when there's confounding that would otherwise uh, kind of screw you out of identification. Um, more recently, there there have been cases. Uh, especially kind of in the machine learning community, there have been cases where people have proposed uh, approaches that are basically like fit fit a Bayesian model to estimate the distribution of the latent confounder. And then because you have an estimate of that distribution, you can marginalize it out. Um, and those tend to those tend to fail unless you're very careful about the assumptions you're making. Um, here, here, you know, the assumptions that we're making are arguably unreasonable but the point is like if you're willing to believe the, assum the, the, the assumption of independence that, that I pointed out uh, then you get these results and if you're not willing to assume it then there should be a there's a reasonable path forward for how to do sensitivity analysis and how to quantify how uncertain and how wrong you might be about those estimates. Uh, yeah that makes sense thanks. Um, a, a other questions for Eli? Uh, if there's nothing else, I guess we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Eli, and thank you thank everyone you. for joining us today. Um, the uh, next seminar will be Trang in three weeks on May 19th. Um, until then, uh, stay safe, uh, and this will go on YouTube soon. Uh, talk to you later, everybody. Thanks.